Welcome to the Make Your Brain Happy podcast, hosted by Veronique Cardone, MS. The podcast where you'll learn how to live your life to its fullest potential. This is for anyone who's interested in the science of the brain or wants to seize the power of positive thinking, enhanced mental performance, and a healthy lifestyle. Hi, and welcome to the podcast, Make Your Brain Happy. Today, I am very delighted to have as my guest, Dr. Clifford Lazarus. Uh, Dr. Lazarus is a licensed psychologist, co-founder of the Lazarus Institute and current world authority in multimodal CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy. He specializes in healthy psychology, and we need it right now, Mm -hmm. and collaborative psychopharmacy, well, because we may need it as well. In addition to these these multiple publications, he's a regularly featured um, guest and author and a blogger on psychology today. And I see you've been very active lately. Among various awards and recognition, he has been honored by the Prescribing Psychologist Register for his contributions in training psychologists in psychopharmacology. He's also an honorary professor of psychology at the University of Flores in Buenos Aires. It's even rhyming. So welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited. We are talking today about something that's really a lot on our minds and in our lives, which is, of course, COVID-19 and all the implications it has on our lifestyle or psyche or well-being or um, a mental um, ability to, to deal with it. And as a psychologist, I'm sure, Dr. Lazarus, that uh, it has appended or so- certainly transformed uh, what is being discussed? What are the issues uh, at heart? Um, you know, of your of your patients, right? Yes. Yes. So, um, so let me get right into the the topic. So, masks, wearer, non wearer, promoter, advocate, um, enemy, whatever. I am a mask wearer uh, because in my mind. I protect myself, but mostly I protect others. But I've read so much lately about what's going on, right, with um, with this this mask issue. So, what's what's your what's the psychological issues behind those decisions? Am I wearing one or not? Well, uh, let me let me just state uh, right from the start: wearing a mask is really a very important thing to do. Mm-hmm. The whole issue, of course, has been politicized, and that's right. one of the reasons people don't wear masks, because they feel they're making a political statement, or if you wear a mask, you're not really reflecting your, your patriotism, which, of course, is the exact opposite of the facts. Uh, it, it is not a political statement whether or not someone wears a mask. Mm-hmm. It is simply a patriotic duty and a socially responsible thing to do period. Mm -hmm. Now, there are reasons people don't wear masks. Uh, Some of it has to do with education level. There is an association between college graduates and non-college graduates that suggests the higher one is on the educational scale, the more likely they are to wear masks. Uh, Now, of course, uh, any question we ask about psychology will always have to be uh, stipulated with a, it depends. I mean, we can't have a kind of a blanket answer for any question that has to do with, with the uniqueness of human beings. But mm-hmm. there are certain correlations or associations. So people don't wear masks because they feel they're making a political statement. They're not recognizing, again, their patriotic duty and the social responsibility of mask wearing. Sometimes people don't wear masks uh, because they feel it's a sign of weakness. There's also a relationship between gender and mask wearing. Women tend to, on whole, wear masks more than men, but this is not that unexpected because we know that men tend to engage in more risky behavior than women. They're more likely to speed when they drive. They don't seek medical attention as often as women. So women, it seems, just have a natural tendency to be a little more safe and health conscious. But I think the the answer, the, the, the most concise answer, to the question, well, why don't some people wear masks is simply scientific illiteracy. 
people don't understand science. They don't recognize the importance of listening to experts like uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci. Uh, they are somewhat mistrusting or suspicious of these kinds of messages because they have been just so politicized. But just like people need to learn to read and write and do arithmetic to establish a foundation of fundamental literacies, it's a pity our schools don't emphasize the importance of teaching science and therefore giving people in their repertoire a skill when it comes to understanding the underpinnings of what it is that drives science and medicine. But there must be also some uh, hidden or, you know, uh, unconscious bias about wearing a mask. I was reading about this, uh, uh, of, you know, the fear to not be yourself or, I mean, the, or to, you know, to not feel like you are really free. Well, yes. well, you know, I bet you you are you are facing this with some of your of your patients. You well, this is right. People feel it's an infringement on their personal liberties. They mm -hmm. feel that uh, it's being foisted upon them, and they they like to be stubbornly independent. And this country is based on, of course, independent thinking, a certain degree of rebelling against uh, the the authorities, but. That uh, is, is really misguided. Uh, it, it, is, it is quite misguided. Uh, and sometimes it can also be, again, um, people feel, men particularly, it, it reflects a kind of a weakness that, you mm -hmm. know, you're showing your vulnerability or, yes. or your weakness if you're, you're wearing a mask. And again, I just can't emphasize how essential it is that people do wear masks because it's not just for their safety, but of course it's for the safety of other people. And in terms of this infringement on our liberties, well, let's remember, uh, not so long ago, people were complaining about their liberty to smoke in public venues. Or and to now wear, they can't wear a seatbelt, or wear a seatbelt, right? Or wear a seatbelt. Uh huh. And, and also, look, we have to wear clothes. People can say, "I'm not going to wear any clothes." You can't force me yeah, to wear yeah. clothes. Well, you know, we can't go around without clothing because we have certain uh, social contracts that yeah. have stipulated that's really inappropriate behavior. But so, just like we can no longer smoke in public venues because there's irrefutable scientific evidence of the dangers of smoking, mm -hmm. secondhand smoke, for instance, is toxic. And now someone's very breath can be a potential lethal force. So if we can't smoke in public to protect the health, the safety, and the welfare of our population, it's preposterous to think we can go around expiring potentially lethal viral particles on other individuals who are just trying to maintain their health, safety, and welfare for themselves and family and others. But do you think it's also because I mean, we don't see it, right? It's not like we, we saw at the beginning, I remember we saw a lot of pictures of people in the hospital that were like completely not even humans anymore because they had disappeared under the, the layers of, uh, you know, machines that were yes. trying to save their lives. But we don't see it, right? I, I went shopping this morning and yes, I'm wearing a mask, um, but... And the threat is in the air or on surfaces, but it's invisible. And when I and and so it's difficult to wear um, something like a shield when the enemy is invisible or that you know you don't really see the consequences unless you have really been touched in your family. Like I know people who have lost grand, both grandparents, father, mother. So. It's like, do you need to be touched or what, what is the turning point? But I have to say um, that when I wear a mask, I feel like I am not myself or it's not just the mask. It's also I see people, even my family, you know, unless we were tested recently and we knew with my daughter's, my daughter and her husband and she's pregnant that we were all safe. Right. Yeah. But I feel a barrier between myself and my friends is very bizarre, like a 
because we need the human touch, we need to, right? we need the hugs, we need all those things. Right. So, wh what are your patients telling you about this? You know, uh, in this time of isolation, especially if you are dealing with depression, uh, anxiety, fear, and other mental issues. Yes. Well, uh, to, to state the obvious, this pandemic landed on us with a, a dramatic and somewhat traumatic impact that has just completely dislocated us from our previous lives so quickly. A simple thing like going to the grocery store now has all these layers of perceived danger associated with it. When the virus first was really getting traction and we began to realize the full scope of its breadth as a pandemic and how particularly it's, it's affecting this country. You know, the United States uh, has 4% of the global population, yet we have more than 25% of the global cases. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's ridiculous when we think about here we are until recently a, a leader in health, in technology, in science and medicine. And now it's almost as if we've become a third world country in terms of the incidence of this avoidable illness. Uh, there's no reason that this, this devastating disease had to be as widespread as it is. We could have and should have contained it, but we didn't. So we can look in the rearview mirror. Uh, we, we have to go forwards. Lots of people have been affected by this quite greatly. And there is a bizarre surrealness to it. I remember how struck I was, oh, several months ago when I was in my local grocery store and I noticed just how sparsely populated it was. Uh, normally it would have been packed with consumers, yeah. but there were very few people in the store and everyone happily was wearing a mask, myself included. And I looked around and I said, my goodness, this looks like a scene from some kind of apocalyptic science fiction movie, yeah. a genre I used to be quite uh, a fan of, but maybe not so much anymore. I prefer apocalypses when they're fiction and I'm watching them in the audience, yeah. not when I'm on the stage with the other poor souls who are being afflicted by it. And also there was originally this sense of like pervasive danger for the very reasons you mentioned, Veronique. We, we, we can't see this adversary, no. it's invisible, no. and still it's lethal. So we're not sure where it is. It could be lurking around any corner on any surface, uh, affecting any person we might come against. So I remember at first when I would step out of my bubble, my safe bubble of my home, uh, I would feel like I had entered into uh, the Chernobyl exclusion zone and the air was just permeated with danger, like the radiation after the Chernobyl disaster. Happily, that's not the case. We no. do know a lot about the virus at this point. So how we can identify what are potential hotspots contagious areas, and then the appropriate behavior we can take to maintain safety by taking appropriate precautions. But what is the, what is the, what do you have to deal with, with your patients? What was the extra layer that all this added to the issues? Or were you going to tell yeah. me? No. Well, it's made, it's made people who were phobic and anxious a lot more phobic and anxious. It's brought people who had in the past we would have called subclinical anxiety to rise to the threshold where now we consider their difficulties to be clinically significant. That means uh, of the severity that would benefit from professional or medical attention. So there are anxious people who have gotten a lot more anxious, and there were some people who were mil minimally anxious who've gotten really quite so significant. So it's, in it's increased. And what, what are the major causes of anxiety? Okay, I know the virus, but I guess now you're adding all the layers about all the uncertainties, right? Is exactly. it was getting better? No, it's getting worse. Again, then fall is coming, so... How, how do you help your, your patient? And I think the people who are listening, like me, I have anxiety too, would benefit from, from your advice. How, how do you de-dramatize or get your patients to, you know, like to lower the level of anxiety? That's an, that's an excellent question. And the, the 
spot on comment you made is that anxiety really occurs when people feel that their sense of safety and security is really not that Mm -hmm. firm, that there's a a perception of threat, risk, danger, and people want a sense of safety and security and and some comfort in their lives. So that really seems to be the underpinnings of, of what drives the whole engine of anxiety. What I do clinically is essentially the the standard cognitive behavioral methods of anxiety management, which starts with identifying what might be uh, exaggerated or possibly even erroneous uh, ideas. Uh, Essentially in cognitive behavioral therapy, the broad brushstroke is we try to help people by uh, corrective thinking and corrective action. Corrective thinking often means identifying misinformation. That is information people are missing, uh, such as you're not very likely to contract this virus if you're just walking outside in your neighborhood and you're maintaining appropriate physical and social distance and you wear personal protective equipment. So it's not something that's just saturating the air and it's Mm -hmm. going to get you. So we try to provide we try to correct missing information and provide missing information. It's interesting what you say, because I was reading recently that all healthcare practitioners, physicians, um, nurses, and so forth, they had to change the way they are dealing with their patients because they have to deal with the misinformation as well. Or, you know, somebody was telling me, um, it's a friend of mine who is a doctor, a, a family practitioner, that he had patients who had, they had asthma, they are smokers, they are 65 plus, so they are at higher risk. And uh, to your point that they were saying, well, I don't wear a mask because I don't believe it's going to protect me, that they said it was really hard for them that they were into mask education mode yes. because they were, and, but they said, but it was almost a denial or it was difficult for those patients to accept. I am at higher risk. Therefore, I really need to wear a mask to protect myself. So it was well, like a form of denial. That's exactly right. Denial is a, a really big part of what gets people snagged by, by some of these difficulties and uh, what gets people to uh, fail to engage in appropriate health behaviors, uh, the dangers of smoking, the dangers of yeah. unhealthy eating, yeah. the dangers of being sedentary, yeah. the dangers but- of alcohol. There's a ton of denial. Uh, with with a lot of things, but that's an excellent case in point. We need to provide missing information, which is, well, you know, here is why it is that masks Mm -hmm. are very helpful and can cut your risk dramatically. And, you know, here's the misinformation, which somehow people uh, began to believe, which is, oh, you know, masks actually uh, aren't helpful. In fact, originally, very early on, back in late March, uh, there were some so-called medical experts who were decrying yeah. of masks, saying, oh, no, masks actually increase your risk of getting the virus. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So people have locked onto that and have ignored a whole array of subsequent information that has utterly yeah, but but we have to be, I agree, you know, I, I remember there was a lot of contradicting information and also a lot of unknown about the virus still today. So I kind of put myself in the, in, 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 in other people's shoes and say, well, I understand that it can be a questioning of the science of questioning of the information, but I want to ask you, because I do this sometime for other reasons. Why do are we in denial? What what is the mecha, what is the the issue between behind the being in denial? What is the psychological? That is, issue? That's that's really a, a massive question. Yeah. Why do okay. the, the <laughs> okay. people use denial yeah. as a, a psychological defense? But that's really, I think, the the just one dimensional answer. I think we'd really have to have an entire conversation okay. about. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's to protect people from anxiety. They okay. don't want to acknowledge the threat, the risk, or danger is real. 
So mm-hmm. they, in a way, play the ostrich maneuver, bury their heads in the sand and fail to acknowledge the reality of this actual threat. Mm-hmm. And it's a bit strange because people are often poor at uh, risk assessment. That's another aspect of psychological and also scientific literacy that would be helpful for people to learn more about. You know, how can we be more accurate in our appraisals of risks? So we're not overreacting to minimal or imaginary risks and then failing to take mm-hmm. appropriate precautions for actual threats and risks and dangers. But denial is a, is a gigantic issue, and it is certainly part of what's driving the yeah. engine yeah. of people's non-compliant yeah. behavior. Uh, they're denying that the certain uh, media information is factual. It's, mm-hmm. it's fake. So they're in denial about the legitimacy of a lot of truly uh, authoritative sources of information. And uh, so, it, again, it's, it's, it's a very big issue that I, I hope maybe in a, in a future um, Interview. conversation we might be able to unpack. So, the, so um, Clifford, I'm very happy you saying this about, you know, the ability of, of people to really assess a big threat versus a mild one. Mm-hmm. And adolescents are notoriously oh, known yeah. because their brain is still in development to not right. be good at that. That's why we do those crazy things when we're younger. Right. Right. So let's address this, you know, um, how, how can we help younger people to become more responsible and uh, because their actions have huge impact on everybody around them? So um, do you have those issues with some of your patients? With some. Uh, my, my practice is mostly uh, adult, but I okay. do have adolescents who are, are on my roster. And, and you're absolutely right. Uh, the, the adolescent brain is still some time away from its full adult maturity. Mm-hmm. And interestingly, the final step of our brain's maturation is a, a process called prefrontal myelinization, yes. which sounds very complicated. But the frontal lobes of our brain are really our like executive executive center. That's where our, it's kind of our, our, our intellectual chief executive officer planning and apprising consequences and using good judgment and having appropriate impulse control and the ability to empathize. Mm-hmm. All of that seems to be the final steps of our brain's maturation mm-hmm. that often doesn't take place until most people are in their early to mid twenties. And For that and other reasons, uh, young people definitely engage in a great degree of risky behavior because they're not really able to do good reality testing. Again, like risk assessment. And also a lot of adolescents, particularly males, have this sense of invincibility that they seem to believe that they're invulnerable and nothing can hurt them and they're not going to get sick. And of course, that's uh, why the number one cause of death in teenagers is accidents, mostly traffic accidents, but other accidents nonetheless, just because of the inherent risky behavior that that particular population engages in. And there's not much that we can do clinically except hope we have a fertile mind in an adolescent who is open to information and will respect the source of the information. So if I can tell a young person, well, you know, maybe if, if this, this virus gets you, it, it may not land you up in critical care on a respirator, but we can't be so sure because there are young people who are having extreme yeah, yes. yeah. critical illness mm-hmm. and die. But sure, statistically speaking, older individuals tend to be far more vulnerable. So why on earth would you want to take the risk of bringing this this horrible thing to your family, to your parents, to your grandparents? So explaining to them that there is a range of symptoms and that the phenomenon of asymptomatic carriers is important for them to kind of get their heads around. And all we can really do is hope that they will get on board with the importance of being socially responsible and engaging in appropriate protective behavior. But, you know, adolescents are always going to be adolescents and they do represent a risk to themselves. And now, unfortunately, that risk ripples 
uh, to their families and indeed their communities and then you know the population in general. It, it really is a, a challenge uh, to get young folks to kind of get on board with the mm-hmm. idea that we all have to pull together as a team here. I've actually in one of my blog posts uh, recently written, uh, how would our species handle an alien invasion? And yeah. I like in the COVID-19 <laughs> invasion to an extraterrestrial invasion, essentially saying, I would hope that if some uh, very hostile ET decided to pay us a visit on this planet, that all we human beings would put our petty differences and grievances aside and really pull together as a unified species to defend our lives and our planet from this hostile invader. Well, this is probably as close as we're likely to get to an actual extraterrestrial invasion. And just like ET isn't going to care about our race, our gender, our age, our socioeconomic status, Mm -hmm. our religious beliefs, it will kill you regardless. That's how this virus is. And if we, as a civilization, cannot really pull together, well, you know, um, it is not one of the the prouder things to have to acknowledge in terms of of being a member of the the human species. I would much rather people had much more of a collaborative and enlightened worldview in general, and particularly with this grave threat the likes of which we have never experienced before. Mm-hmm. Even the 102 year ago, a great epidemic of 1918 was quite different than what we're up against now with this novel coronavirus. But Varnik, if you have some ideas on how we can really rein in and get more cooperation and compliance with uh, the younger kids and folks, I'm all ears. Yeah, you know, I, I think, uh, well, I, you know, I have older kids now, but I, I really believe that I don't know, maybe, um, you know, leveraging uh, their empathy and um, not going through um, uh, the consequences as that are hypothetical, but more about, you know, who do you care for in your life, even if you're an adolescent, right? You care about your pa- your parents, you care about your, your brother, your, your family. So maybe it's um, something about, you know, appealing to their heart and um, yes. and uh, caring about others, even if I know we are more selfish when we are younger. Um, right. Well, that is the problem, the, the lack of empathy that young people have. Uh, and that's not a criticism. It's just really a, a statement of, of maturational fact. Now, some children, uh, t- to their credit, really do have an ability to think of the other to think outside of themselves, beyond their own wants and needs, and really connect with other people's feelings. Uh, But those tend to be the exception. And it takes a while for the brain to really get that equipment to develop and then come online. What is known is that young people do actually still, um, they're greatly influenced by peer pressure. And this, so, this so so then we need younger people who got COVID or who had an aha moment to to share. Like we need social networks. Now we need TikTok, for instance. We do, or, or we have need stories about this. Like uh, Greta Thunberg, who yeah. is uh, an outspoken yeah. advocate about really taking seriously yeah. the, the the equal existential threat of a global warming and climate change. So mm-hmm. she's, she's got a huge uh, population of people who are really rallying behind her. And we, what we can do to influence the minds of young people is to find a few who do have yeah. more of a champions, realistic champions. perspective yeah. and can peer-to-peer appeal to them. Yeah. Just like a friend could say, hey, man, what are you smoking for? That's dumb. Can't you yeah, read? Yeah, look, yeah. look, the label on this thing says this stuff will kill you. I mean, come on. Yeah. They could hear that message from me. They could hear that message from their parents. But when they hear it from their friend group, then it might really kind of sink in a little bit more. Yeah. But that's one method we could use to try to find young people who really, you know, are aware yeah. and can really get behind the the social responsibility and the importance of personal protection that's necessary to really try to mitigate the ongoing exponential expansion of cases and increasing deaths from this terrible disease. 
But so let let me go now to something else that ha- I mean has to do with younger people also, but everybody. We we are social beings. We need to be together. We need to mingle. We need to touch other people. We need to hug. We we need to feel like we live in a community. And this summer, I was at the beach, and my daughter had a friend who came, and it was totally socially distant. We did not even eat together. It was just a beach visit. And she has an adorable little 17 months old boy. And um, the, the mother was constantly holding her son and preventing him from going socially to us. He wants to, he wants to touch, he wants to speak to, I mean, he, you know, he wants to, to be with others. And I was saying, well, what is going to be the impact of those years? Because, I mean, it's been going on now since March. It's going to continue 2021. What's the impact on the education of our little ones? Or like all you know now is maybe Zoom for a class because you don't even have a chance to go to school. You know what I mean? Yes. But uh, as a psychologist, what what is going to be the imp- I mean. I'm not asking you to read in the future, but we, it has an impact on the social development of those kids. Well, it does. It will have an impact on their social and their emotional, as well as their, their cognitive development, because this is really not a, a natural environment no, no. for human beings to, to live in. Uh, we have been so constrained. Uh, it's like uh, our, our lives have been straitjacketed. So what the consequences will be, I mean, I can really only speculate, but I, I'm not, um, I don't think they'll be terrific, but I don't think they'll be as bad as some people may yeah. think either because children and people are still remarkably adaptable. The human beings have an uncanny ability to adjust and to change either the external environment or some of their behavioral patterns to conform with just the the milieu, the environment, the circumstances. But touch is so important, and I think that's one of the biggest deprivations that people are feeling during this time, because unless we are able to interact with members of our, what are called now pods, yeah. uh, the people whom we believe yeah. are safe yeah. and appropriately uh, cautious, like, like we are ourselves, uh, people are really missing hugging and touch. And, and it's so important for human beings because if we think evolutionarily, we were sensing and feeling beings long before we were thinking beings. That, even the smell, even the smell, right? Absolutely. The five yeah. primary senses of our sight and yeah. sound and smell and mm-hmm. taste and touch, uh, this comes right into those deep parts of the nervous system. It just completely transcends analysis, interpretation, thinking. And it gets right again into the sensory and the emotional heart of uh, our humanity. The good news is that young children, as long as they are in, engaging in touch and play with their primary caregivers or their parents, they're mm-hmm. still getting an adequate they amount it, yeah. of nourishment and nourishment. Mm-hmm. The concern might be since they're not being passed to grandparents and to friends and to aunts and uncles, that there will be... Uh, a lack of diversity in terms of what their brain begins to pattern as safe other touch. And then what this can lead to is what we would call separation or stranger anxiety, which is typical in terms of children's development. But we may see an increase in that particular phenomenon where young children who were born and spent some of those crucial sensitive years of emotional and sensory development uh, in this, this terrible confinement and constrained life, we might see an increase in some of that uh, anxious attachment and what we would call stranger or separation anxiety. But just- uh, we don't have enough anxiety. Now we're going to add that. Well, I mean, these are extraordinary times and uh, Mm -hmm. we 
just can't know uh, how this is going to turn out. Uh, but I do think we can be optimistic. We will get yes. in front of this eventually, and we will then enter whatever the new normal is. But people have, as I had mentioned, adapted and recovered and thrived despite uh, devastating uh, social impacts and health challenges, uh, World War I. Concurrently, yeah. Yeah. the pandemic of 1918, and then we've had other crises, World War II, civil rights, Vietnam, 9-11. So there really have been these game-changing events that we have been able to move on from and generally continue to, to thrive and go forward. So I've, I'm quite optimistic eventually we'll be able to get out in front of this as well. No, that's a, that's very uh, that's uplifting. <laughs> it means that not everything is. But how do you build resilience? I bet that you are helping your patients uh, in strengthening their ability to you know to cope with the fear, with the anxiety, and so forth. Right. So we're getting at the end of this okay. wonderful discussion. So I make sure you share with us like some coping mechanism. You know. Well, you Excellent. Of that, that really gets to the heart of the matter and yes. what I'd really like to share with, with yes. your audience. Yes. Um, and that is what I have found to really be somewhat insulating from the stress and the distress that this, this, this whole pandemic has brought into our lives. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, let me preface this by saying what I'm about to mention is not scientifically verified data. This is anecdotal information. That is information that has been acquired through my own personal clinical experience and observation, as well as uh, those ideas and opinions from some of my trusted and esteemed colleagues. Mm -hmm. But we've come to a kind of a consensus. Okay say that here are some helpful hints for coping with COVID-19. Yeah. Not the disease per se, but just the era, the yeah. COVID-19 era. Yeah. First, if someone has retained their employment, that's extremely important because having employment and a source of income is vitally important for the very reason it tends to stabilize that foundation of safety and security that people need in their lives. Yes. So if a person has been among the, the devastating number of casualties who are now unemployed, it just amplifies uh, so much of the stress they're feeling. But then it also allows them to perhaps reduce that impact by following some of these other hints. So we'll assume this is for people who uh, have employment or don't have employment, and that employment uh, would have to, of course, be safe. And that's really, I think, the overarching aspect. People need to feel that they're safe in their homes, that they're not living in a home that is consistently putting them at a sense of being at risk or being threatened because of failure to comply with the safety recommendations by the CDC and other health organizations. So that's important. We have that foundation of a sense of safety and security and insulation from the virus itself in our homes and our places of work if we uh, are still going to a brick and mortar building. So routine is very important for people. It seems that sticking to a routine, because a lot of people now, kids are being taught remotely, people are working through uh, telecommuting and there's all sorts of remote work going on. Nevertheless, we want to still maintain a routine. Uh, sticking to consistent patterns of, of when we go to bed, of when we get up, of when we have meals, and other kinds of just consistent patterns of activity gives us a, a sense of structure, gives us a sense mm -hmm. of, of direction, predictability, and control. And, and that's not an illusion. That's very real in the small scale of our day-to-day -day lives. So routine is very important. Family time is also very helpful. I think a, a two-edged sword of this, this pandemic is that it has gotten families to become pods and mm -hmm. stay together. And then this gives people an opportunity to engage in uh, some just tried and true routines of mealtime together, of mm -hmm. activities as a family, watching movies, even doing chores cooperatively, playing board games. So it gives families a chance to really kind of bond and to pay attention to what's most important in our lives. And, and that is the health, the safety, and the love 
of our families. Now, the other side to that coin, of course, is young people, college age kids or young adults who are now forced to come back home. It can be very difficult for them because yeah. they had to relinquish uh, some of the independence that they had enjoyed. And there can be conflict with parents, which is especially the case and particularly difficult if a, a person who is, say, part of the LGBTQ community is forced to come back home and has a family who may not really be accepting who they are as a human being. This can be quite a challenge, but the hope is it will motivate families to use this time to seek out counseling, some kind of support or intervention that can get them to connect despite some of what these differences in, in worldview might be. Staying socially connected is very important, and unfortunately, we can't do it with the touch aspect we had spoken about, but maintaining virtual connections with people through uh, FaceTime, Zoom, Skype, yeah, telephone, yeah. Just, just getting out of the, the isolation that can be part of what just intensifies our distress and anxiety. And ideally, if we can have actual interactions Again, with appropriate physical distance and all safety precautions, that can also be helpful because the two-dimensional video conferencing is great, oh. awesome technology. It's not enough. It's not enough. Yeah. It's not four-dimensional. In fact, yeah. I have, uh, with, with some very select patients, agreed to meet with them in person in my parking lot on comfortable chairs yes. in a nice little <laughs> nook where we have total privacy yeah. and we can maintain physical distance. Yeah. Some people really prefer that to doing a, a teleconferencing. Yeah. 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 So virtually connected and ideally actually connected to our friends and families is, is tremendously insulating. I, as a health psychologist, can never emphasize enough the importance of exercise. That's the fifth one, right? You said, you know, social, I mean, like a certain form of security with your job. You said, um, we want, we want job, your, your we family, want, social connections. We want, we want family time, maintaining our social connections as much as possible. Work, you know, and, working and, and having a routine. Routine is important. Establishing routine gives us a sense of structure and consistency and a degree of predictability yeah. in this very uncertain time, which can give us a, a greater sense of perceived control. We may not have control over the external world, but we do have some control yeah. in the microcosm of our lives. And that's why the routine is, is so important. So now, I'll just say what I'll say about exercise in terms of how there's been a, a tremendous increase in anxiety and depression, exacerbation of depressed people's symptoms and anxious people's symptoms, and emergence of anxiety and depression in people perhaps for the first time. So if possible, exercise is vitally important because we know there's, again, uh, unassailable science that has shown yeah. appropriate kinds of exercise bring about the same changes in our brain metabolism as antidepressant and other prescription psychiatric drugs. So instead of taking something for the anxiety and depression, people can do something about it. But that does take quite a commitment because we're not talking about just, you know, a leisurely stroll around the block. We're really talking about vigorous exercise on a regular pattern. Two more things I would say are very important. Um, having a hobby would be helpful so that people can really meaningfully put themselves into some kind of activity that they find gratifying. Uh, it could be anything, uh, baking, cooking, uh, gardening, wood carving, writing. Uh, or, or going back to school. That's what I did at the beginning. Or indeed, yeah. I went back to school and I got some certificates in neuroscience Excellent. at Harvard. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's something it you made me really feel good about, about myself, in fact. Yes, the, yeah. the, the, the stimulation, the creative outlet of having a hobby can be, can be very rewarding yeah. in all times, but particularly this time. And then finally, I would say, uh, again, it sounds like uh, just, just the same old, same old, but, you know, eating clean is very oh, important. Well. 
And, and speak to my heart know, here. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the Pope in this respect. <laughs> the Pasta diet is absolutely yeah, yeah. fantastic. And you know more than most people about yeah. the importance of healthy, sensible nutrition. And, and this, is, this is vital, not just because what we eat does have an impact on our metabolism and our mind, our brain health, our overall health, and our psychological perspective. It actually can shift some of our moods, uh, really the nutrients, the micronutrients, and various things that we're getting from food. But here's where it gets more important. Uh, not surprisingly, because of people being disconnected from their previous lives during this pandemic, there's less physical activity in general. People are more sedentary. They're, they're not getting up and walking around like they would yeah. at their office, talking, hanging out at the water, cool, yeah. going for coffee, uh, commuting. So there's just a real reduction in the baseline of physical activity that people are getting. And what's worse is people are eating more because there's some emotional eating going on. It's like a self-soothing behavior where people feel, boy, I've been cut off from so many of the rewarding activities in my life. Well, at least I can have these nice snacks. That's not so great because it seems a lot of people have been gaining weight during these past five or six months. And what we do know among the risk factors for having a bad case and a bad outcome, should someone become infected with this novel coronavirus, is obesity. Is a yeah, huge, studies are coming out now, right? Especially a, with men, by the way. Exactly. Yes. It is a huge risk factor yeah. right up there with diabetes and with asthma and other kinds of pulmonary conditions. Mm -hmm. So eat clean. So, so in, in essence, we want to hope we, we've got employment. We want to maintain routines in our life. We want to use this opportunity for staying connected with our families and, and just maintaining those very deep bonds. We also want to extend that to our overall social network and try to stay uh, virtually or if possible actually connected to friends, you know, going for walks together, going for hikes together, meeting for lunch or coffee safely. But, but it's, it, you have to have the ability to also, in my opinion, find joy in simple thing. It's not about we used to go to the movie theater and have popcorns and then we were going to the restaurant and whatever. Now it's more about where well, we went for a walk on the beach or exactly. uh, we shared a very simple meal outside. Like things are simpler. Quite and right. You need to find joy in smaller things. And I, I, I believe, because I did, is that if you are embracing this simpler, less um, quite exciting every, or exciting every five seconds type of life, then you can thrive, in fact, during those times. Right. Well, you, you again and, are spot on. Uh, what you have said is really the final hint that I have for people, and that is to learn about and try to practice and cultivate a mindful headspace. Yeah mindfulness which I, is just in, in a mindful, nice, mindfulness and simplicity i, mindfulness I would say simplicity. absolutely yeah. mindfulness mm -hmm. just simply said for those who may not be familiar is essentially the non-judgmental acceptance of our experience where we don't analyze we don't try to control we don't try to interpret or judge but it's just really the acceptance of things that are happening in our minds yeah. and savoring is so important because in mindfulness we want to be present we want to really use our senses to plug in to the now to see and smell and taste and touch and hear what's in our immediate environment and try not to have our minds project into the unknowable and uncertain future because yeah. that won't change what's yeah. in front of us. All it will do is take us out of the opportunity to do exactly what you're recommending and that is just enjoy the simple pleasures mm -hmm. of everyday living. So yeah, that's well, the, you're absolutely to right the because... helpful hints mm -hmm. that I recommend to people who are seeking my services to try to manage the unprecedented challenges that this pandemic has brought to us. So um, I think we, we've covered everything that we needed um, really to cover. I really like the way we are finishing this amazing discussion about um, enjoying the more simple thing in life and finding joy 
in little things. Um, I, I, to me, COVID-19 has been an opportunity to reassess a few things in my life and, and to become stronger, in fact. Even if not everything is rosy, you know, it's not like I have a perfect life, believe me. And um, I think it's about accepting also that Kind of, it's not the same life anymore. It's a, it's another life, and I, I don't know. I, I bet from a resilience perspective, if you are able to embrace another type of life, you are stronger for the future, right? Instead of always being in the past, I regret this. I miss this. I miss this. If you put your mind into well, but now. I walk more often with my husband, which is true. We eat together every day. We cook together. I mean, there's a lot of things that are so positive. So that's right. There is a, a silver lining to this. It's yeah. caused us to uh, it, it somewhat uh, literally unplug from just so many of the device-driven distractions. Even though uh, you know, I, yeah, toxically, <laughs> we're more reliant on devices. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, young people now and and people in general are really craving actual social get-togethers. Yeah. Whereas before, they yeah. would they these virtual relationships was, was kind of the norm. Now people are beginning to realize the important yeah. actuality yeah. and not living a life of virtuality. And yeah. so therefore we can now get refocused on the important things in our life, love and family and friends and simple joys from yeah. just activities of daily living. Mm -hmm. Well, so thank you so much, uh, Clifford. I feel like I don't want to call you Dr. Lazarus anymore. <laughs> And um, I thank you for being on the Make Your Brain Happy. You made my brain happy today. You gave me some hope. Um, I have decided to embrace a brighter side of life, and this is why I created this podcast. But thank you so much, and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you, Veronique. It's a pleasure to be here. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us for the Make Your Brain Happy podcast. This episode was recorded by Veronique Cardone and produced by HG Media. If you enjoy our podcast, please share it with your friends. You can find our podcast on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and wherever you listen to podcasts.